That's it? And then okay. usually we want somebody to hop on the YouTube yeah. and make sure that the stream is starting at the right right. How do we open the Um it should just be open actually. There it is. Just poke around on this one. Yeah. Okay. He, Dr. G also likes asking you to come up to help him with this sometimes. And you get stuck. Yes. Just, just press this one's less complicated than like my whole one. <laughs> now it's streaming too. Do we have to change the title? It should be. Yeah, so um, ideally, before every lecture, you guys should be changing the title just too. Just update the title. Just update. Yeah, so you just it's not that big a deal because most people can figure out like if there's the only thing live. It's, it's yeah. Perfect. Yeah, I think it's working. Is it streaming? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then from here, you just want to. Um, always alt tap back into this one because this is where he can control the slides from. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Wonderful. It took Dream longer than normal, but we get to it. Yes. Feeling accomplished. Alright, <laughs> right, thank thanks guys. Thank you. sitting on this side today. Yes. Don't you normally sit there? No? Really? Okay. Okay. I feel like I'm getting confused now. All right, folks, I think, um, I think we're going to get going in about one minute, just to give you a little bit of context as to uh, what's going to happen. So I'm hoping that all of you had a good experience at your tutorials. I've been asking some of you uh, just before class started, um, except for the room itself being kind of not so great. I'm hoping that you had um, uh, a useful time in your tutorials. So what will happen this week is you'll get the same type of tutorial uh, as you did last week, so an informative and um, a review tutorial. Next week in tutorial, you will be doing a practice uh, test. So it's a smaller version of what you'll get um, on February the 4th. You'll be able to go through that with your TA. So you'll do that for about 20 to 25 minutes. You'll then take up the answers with your TAs. And then you'll be able to take that test um, away with you. So please make sure that you're going to tutorials. We do want them to be useful and informative for you. We're using the tutorials a slightly different way than you, we would in other HMB courses, which is really to get you ready for the different assignments or the different term tests. All right, so we'll, we'll get going in like one minute. So um, talk amongst yourselves because you're not going to talk to me, right? So OK, one minute. You're, you're a very shy class. <laughs> yeah. I, I, sent, I, I got your uh, link for your grad school thing. So. Not about that. OK, yeah? Yeah. Maybe. We'll see how that goes today. All right. So I think I think we'll uh, get going if that's okay with you. So we'll have like this lecture and then half of next lecture um, on your term test. So um, please continue to post um, any questions that you have directly on the discussions page. And we're going to be um, continuing on sort of in the um, 
same vein that we were looking at in the last lecture to make sure that you understand the different mechanisms. And again, feel free to ask questions at any point in time, whether during the break uh, or any time during the lecture as well. And apologies, the first uh, 20 some odd slides, um, a lot of the information is up there for you. The last sort of uh, 10 to 15 slides, you're gonna have to do a little bit of writing and there are a couple of things that I've corrected. So I'll point those out to you, but you are gonna have to write just a little bit in the second half. So I'm gonna uh, do a quick little recap in, in the next few slides. Then I'm going to really try to convince you over the next little while that in fact, when we talk about adipocytes, so when I was here at U of T and I was learning about adipocytes in undergrad um, and I had changed my um, undergrad program, so I started off in pharmacology, toxicology, didn't really like the program, then I switched over uh, into um, medical genetics and then I finally ended up in physiology. For us, adipocytes were just sort of a storage vesicle, uh, storage vessel, and we now know that that's no longer true. And Today, I'm gonna to try to convince you that the type of adipocytes that you accumulate, whether it's under your skin or viscerally, intra-abdominally, they are very different. They may look the same, they may have um, similar types of qualities, but their properties, their basic physiology, biochemistry, are completely different. And that's sort of the major takeaway about how these different adipocytes in these different regions can directly influence inflammation. And that's really a concept in health and disease now and in human biology that's incredibly important. We think that the vast majority of diseases are actually caused by inflammation or are prolonged because of inflammation. And this idea of inflammation is one that we're going to be looking at. I'm also going to go back and talk to you a little bit about leptin. I can tell you in advance that when we get to leptin, there are certain slides that um, I'm going to really emphasize. You should take that as a hint for what you should spend time on. If it's a review from physiology, great. And if it's not a review from physiology, make sure that you're taking notes or circling things that you need to come back and revisit later on. It is a classic uh, signaling pathway that I need you to be familiar with because leptin plays a big story in the rest of this um, inflammation. It might sound like it's a little bit of a disconnect, but I'm going to try to connect what happens in terms of metabolic syndrome. So having a lipid dysregulation, having high glucose, having hyperinsulinemia, all of these things lead to cardiometabolic disorders. And you might think, okay, those kind of make sense, but there's also a very strong um, body of literature that suggests that if you have those, you're also going to have mental health related issues. And we're gonna use that to segue into uh, mental health and we'll look at the link between metabolic syndrome, which is what we've been looking at, then into mental health and why we think that inflammation is linked between uh, the metabolic syndrome, which we've been concentrating on, as well as in mental health related issues. So as I mentioned in the last lecture, um, animal models are important. So we looked at a couple of different animal models and we looked at yeast and you should not ignore those. So yeast are things that we um, looked at in terms of fasting and we particularly paid attention to two different mice, um, the OB-OB mouse and then the DB-DB mouse. And the OB-OB mouse, the adipocytes release a faulty version of leptin. There's something wrong with their leptin gene that is transcribed and then translated from the OB gene, which is where the name comes from. OB makes um, the leptin and there's something wrong with the leptin. It can't interact with its receptor and the mouse doesn't know when to stop eating. The other mouse model that I asked you to make sure that you know is the DBDB mouse. In fact, it looks almost identical. There are some slight differences, but there the receptor for leptin is faulty. So in either case, whether it's the leptin or leptin receptor, both mice look like they have type two um, diabetes. And they have lipid dysregulation, hyperinsulinemia, they also have um, hyperglycemia, et cetera. I didn't really talk a lot about the Zucker, uh, Zucker rat, but I'll come back and talk about the Zucker rat um, a little bit later on. And there's nothing else from this slide that you need to really concentrate on. In the last lecture, we also looked at the fact that using metabolic syndrome, using uh, type two diabetes, um, we could also start to look at other forms of diabetes, including type one. Uh, again, very similar, but also dissimilar. So we know, for example, in type one diabetes, that we also have hype 
high glucose levels, but we don't get hyperinsulinemia because there's a problem with the release of insulin because there's an autoimmune function, which we now know is caused by X lymphocytes. And we talked about these dual expressor cells, these X lymphocytes that have the properties of beta lymphocytes or B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes, new for 2019. Um, and we know that there are a number of molecules that are targeted and destroyed by this autoimmune response. And so although there are similarities, type 1 and type 2 are different in that way, and we just use that sort of as an aside and in passing, um, and we'll talk about type 1 a little bit later on um, as well. And I sort of had gone over this slide really quickly, and there were a couple of things that I neglected to kind of mention to you at the time. If you're looking very carefully at this um, particular slide, here at the top, we're looking at these adipocytes. Okay, so these adipocytes, the primary role for the um, things in yellow in that space is the storage of uh, triglycerides, et cetera. And one of the things that you'll see is we get a lot of division of these adipocytes. So when it, the adipocyte gets to be a certain size, it splits and it forms three other adipocytes. These will then continue to um, accumulate more lipids, especially when there is an excess of nutrients, if you're overeating, for example. And one of the things that could happen is that these adipocytes um, also get larger, they store uh, more of the lipids, and then they too will also divide. In fact, one of the things that makes this um, particularly interesting is that we don't really see the loss of adipocytes. They don't normally go away. So if, for example, you're going out and exercising um, and you are losing um, this, the adipocytes are getting smaller, you're actually not losing adipocytes. The only time you lose adipocytes is if they get too big. And I'll get to that in a moment. You can lose them, but that's not the normal way in which uh, weight loss um, uh, occurs. In fact, they just go back to being smaller, but they're still there. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about that. And a lot of this is related to um, how leptin works, at least in this particular disease model as well. And I talked about this OBOB model in the last lecture. Any questions on this or anything that I needed to clarify before we go on? Because this is a new slide. Anything from the last lecture, things that I can reinforce for you, just to clarify for you? Yes? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to try to convince you, and you should probably make sure that you know parts of the, this um, experimental design. We know that these adipocytes, and I've been mentioning this to you for the last lecture and a half, we know that these adipocytes that are there intra-abdominally that we can detect through DEXA scanning, through MRI, et cetera, and the ones that are just under your skin, those subcutaneous forms of fat, not the ones that are packing your bowels intra-abdominally, but the ones that are sort of just under your skin, the subcutaneous adipocytes, they're both adipocytes, but are they the same? We know that they're not the same. And we know this from early experiments, really simple experiments, but experiments that are important nonetheless. So we take these adipocytes from different regions in these rodent models. So for example, we can find subcutaneous uh, fat, so just under the skin in different regions, and where they're found in the mouse is not important, but they're subcutaneous in origin. And we also have visceral white fat, so the fat that's found, the adipocytes that are found packing uh, the, uh, um, the uh, gut of the uh, mouse or the, uh, or the rat. One of the things that we can do is to transplant these into uh, different models. So these transplantation studies where we take subcutaneous fat, remove all of the other fat that's there, and then replace it, uh, the intra-abdominal fat with this um, uh, subcutaneous fat, we can actually observe physiological and metabolic changes in that mouse that's undergone this adipocyte transplantation. Um, and so some of the metabolic effects that we would see coming from the donor mouse to the host mouse, we're putting it in the visceral cavity, in the intra-abdominal cavity in other words, and all we're doing is replacing the type of fat, we're putting in exactly the same amount, it's not less, all we're doing is replacing the adipocytes. And then after transplantation, we wait and we see whether or not there are any metabolic effects. And in fact, we see a, a decline in body weight. We see that the total fat mass decreases. Um, we will also see uh, a decrease in plasma insulin levels, uh, again, um, 
really important. We see normalization of plasma glucose. Glucose tolerance I haven't really talked about. So you take in like a high sugar, high glucose drink. Normally your um, blood glucose spikes. And we don't really see that in these animals um, as well. There's a return of insulin sensitivity. Remember type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance. And now this bullet point is saying we have an increase in insulin sensitivity. They're back being resensitized. Um, the glucose is used over the entire body. We also have um, a, a decrease in this molecule, which is going to play a really important part in the, our discussion today, which is known as adiponectin, and this other molecule that I've been mentioning, leptin. All of these things are lowered simply by removing the abdominal fat that exists and then replacing it with subcutaneous fat, the exact same amount. Okay, adipocytes are not equal. Any questions on that before we go on? Yes. Yeah. So great question. So what if you do it the other way around? So if you replace it um, uh, subcutaneously, like the intra-abdominal fat, uh, to the subcutaneous region, what, what do you suspect will happen? Because there's either going to be no change, uh, there's going to be a change where it becomes um, much more like type 2 diabetes or insulin resistance. Uh, what do you suspect? it becomes more insulin resistant. In fact, it doesn't work the other way around. It's a great question, but it works well this way. It doesn't work well the other way around. So if you replace it the other way, so if you were to take some of the um, intra-abdominal adipocytes and you put them under your skin, it, it doesn't actually cause um, insulin resistance, etc. It's a very interesting phenomenon. Some of that is due to the way that the circulation, the portal circulation works through the gut. It's beyond sort of the scope of what I'm hoping to discuss. I'm just trying to get across this idea, although it's an excellent question, uh, of like why these adipocytes are different, and then segue into that. So a couple of other things that we can look at, there are a number of really important genes that we need to think about. Because when we look at these adipocytes, where they are found, the genes that are already activated in those different regions are also really important. And I'm, I'm going to ask you to avoid the, this slide for the time being, and I'm going to come back to that in a slightly different way. So for now, I would like you to concentrate on these metabolic effects. And I'm hoping that I've convinced you that all adipocytes are not created equally. Do you have any questions on this before we go on? Or anything that I can confirm for you? Yes. Great question. So uh, I should have started with that. Did it already have um, a problem with its metabolism? And in, in fact, it did. It had an issue with metabolism. Yes. So I'm going to I'm going to get to the leptin signaling. I'm going to get to what these different adipocytes in these different regions release, and I'm going to talk about adipokines in a few minutes. Any other questions? No. Okay. Yes, hello. Uh, did they try this with healthy mice? Did they try this with healthy mice? Um, so if your adipocytes are not dysregulated to begin with, then, then it becomes a little bit of a challenge. So when they do it with healthy mice, the, there's no difference. So you have to have been metabolically challenged or have like metabolic syndrome, or you have to use the OB, OB mice that are metabolically uh, challenged already. It's a great question. Any other questions? No. All right, so I'm going to ask you a question then. Important slide to know and um, kind of being able to explain how you might go back and test a theory about adipocytes. Important slide. So for, for me, it's always important that you are able to understand experiments. So being able to uh, retell me about different aspects of this is important. This is it a good slide for you to know. You'll get this emphasized to you again in tutorial. Um, and again, there are some clear differences in the adipocytes. If you were to examine them from someone um, who um, has metabolic syndrome or type 2 diabetes, uh, you can also see that their adipocytes and the hormones or factors that are released from adipocytes, which I'm going to call adipokines, just like cytokines, adipokines are released from adipocytes, are very different from different um, individuals. Um, so especially in individuals with type 2 diabetes that are metabolically dysregulated, so they are insulin um, 
insensitive, they have high glucose levels, um, et cetera, and there are very, very specific differences in these adipokines that are released from these different types of adipocytes. So if you're metabolically challenged, you're going to accumulate more of the adipocytes abdo intra-abdominally, and they're going to have a different set of genes that are being expressed. And if we can remove those and replace them with healthy adipocytes, the ones that we find subcutaneously that are not being challenged, we can actually reverse a lot of the metabolic effects because we're removing those specific adipokines. It's a very interesting and um, kind of fascinating story that I wanted to share with you. So any questions on this before we go on? No? OK. So again, sort of a uh, summary slide. I don't need you to know all of the different elements of this. Um, and in fact, there, some of you might have taken like either a nutrition course or you might have learned it in physiology. Um, these are sort of the classic older ways to um, kind of discuss these different types of adipocytes. What we've been talking about are these visceral white adipose tissue. Um, and what we find here is that we, if we look at the overall uh, adipocytes that are accumulating, accumulating intra-abdominally, uh, especially in the case of insulin or type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance, in metabolic syndrome, uh, what we find is there's a strong association of having, if you, the more of these adipocytes that you have, that you can detect on an MRI, on a DEXA scan, uh, et cetera, uh, the higher the mortality rates are in general. You don't necessarily have to have like a high waist uh, measurement. You don't have to be over 40 inches in circumference. You just need to have a lot of the adipocytes here, and you won't be able to detect them using sort of standard measures uh, in many cases. We know that these adipocytes will be releasing a lot of different factors. There are many of them introduced here for you. I'm going to concentrate on a couple right now because they're the ones that I'm going to emphasize for you. You do not need to know all of them on this list. So for example, resistin is one that we're going to talk about, and it's a very important adipokine. So it's released by these adipocytes, specifically in this visceral, visceral white tissue. We have very, very specific um, increases in macrophages. And if you were to classify macrophages, what would they be classified as? What type of cell? It's not a trick question. So these are kind of like uh, immune cells that we're going to be looking at. Um, and we also have these T cells uh, that are resident within this visceral white tissue as well. The subcutaneous white tissue is very different. It's like insulin sensitive. It has completely different properties. It is going to be releasing this other factor known as adiponectin, which is one I'd like you to know. So you have highlighted resistin, you've highlighted macrophages and T cells, and you've highlighted where we see them. And these are ones where we have like typically associated with low blood glucose and where we have like insulin sensitivity. We have things being released like adiponectin, which we'll talk about a little later. And any of the other things that are on this part of the slide, you don't need to worry about. The microRNAs, you don't need to worry about um, being expressed, et cetera. Yes, Omar. Um, are, so the ones on the left, in terms of the visceral tissue, yes. The subcutaneous ones seem to be a little bit more resistant to the types of changes that we would normally see. Correct, correct. So in healthier individuals, it would look a lot more like the subcutaneous white matter tissue. They're not expressing um, high levels of uh, resistin, nor do we find a lot of macrophages. And I'll, I'll go through that in a minute. Um, so the brown adipose tissue is like the healthy um, type of uh, adi adipocytes. They're the ones that generate heat energy. And then we have sort of a transition. For those of you who took uh, physiology, it's kind of like white um, adipose tissue and brown adipose tissue, what, what do we call those? So it's a, another classification. Anyone? If you mix white and brown, what color do you get? Light brown. Okay, nice. <laughs> nice. No, different color. Gray, close. Yellow. Okay, beige. So beige, um, sort of adipocytes. Um, and again, it's, it's sort of uh, one of those things. Uh, the uncoupling protein is the only thing that I want you to know from this, because we're going to see 
the role of mitochondria. So the uncoupling protein one at the very top, which is UCP1, is found and enriched in mitochondria. It's very important for thermogenesis to generate heat, and we, and we uh, see this quite often in brown adipose tissue. Ultimately, in physiology and in, in human biology, what we're trying to do is to minimize this. And in fact, what we really want to do is to even minimize a subcutaneous white adipose tissue, even though it's not that harmful. It's just that brown adipose tissue is so much better for you. So the people have been trying to convert subcutaneous white into uh, brown adipose tissue as well. So again, really um, fascinating things. So why, why are all of these things so important? Typically, in an adipocyte, and this is a sort of diagrammatic model of an adipocyte, these are the things that potentially can be released from these adipocytes. So we already know leptin is released from adipocytes, and we talked about that in the last lecture. That's where the source of leptin is in your bloodstream. It's coming from the uh, adipocytes after a meal. Um, and they also will release this other factor that I haven't talked about yet, and I will today, which is known as adiponectin. They will also be influenced by and release factors like tumor necrosis factor. They will also be influenced by and release factors uh, like resistin, um, and these are all important. These other molecules that you see here are other factors that are released. I don't need you to memorize those. There's, it's, not, it's not a memorization course. I don't like those types of courses because what's the point in trying to get you to memorize a whole list of different um, proteins? The most important parts in our discussion that we're gonna continue the thread um, on is leptin, adiponectin, as well as resistin, and some of these cytokines like tumor necrosis factor Again, an important factor released from these adipocytes. None of these other ones are ones that I need you to memorize because what's the point in doing that? Any questions on what you need to know from this diagram? No? So we're good so far. So these are potential factors that we need to um, understand a little bit. So this is a really busy slide, and um, there's a lot on this slide. And I'm going to take my time going through this slide because one of these factors is the release of uh, leptin. And leptin is an important um, component um, in all of the uh, different discussions that we need to have. So if we look overall at what's um, sort of happening um, in this uh, process, so one of the things that we can look at is up here at the top, we are looking at um, two different types of uh, nuclei or what, we're, what we call nuclei in the nervous system. Nuclei just refers to uh, a group of neurons. Okay, so here is one nucleus within the hypothalamus. It's a group of neurons, specific, uh, specific group of neurons in the hypothalamus. And this is the ventral hypothalamus. So that's one group of neurons. So remember, hypothalamus is sort of the master regulator. It controls like how you eat and how you sleep and all these other factors. So one small group of nuclei, uh, or one small group of neurons, known as the ventral hypothala hypothalamic uh, nuclei, uh, are responsive to things like leptin. Uh, and in addition, we also have this other group of neurons, which is called the arcuate nucleus, also in the hypothalamus. So they're very close by. They have separate functions, which you'll understand in the next few minutes. So both of these get influenced by leptin. So leptin levels, and we described how leptin levels change after you eat um, or when you're hungry. And these leptin levels are being released from these adipocytes, which is the thread that I've carried on for the last lecture. So, so far, adipocytes causing the release of leptin, leptin traveling back into the bloodstream to the brain, and then working directly on the ventral hypothalamus, as well as, more importantly, on the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus. And that's all I'm going to talk about right now, so I'm just going to do a little check-in. Is that part clear for you? The hypothalamus has two nuclei. The hypothalamus is important for feeding behavior, and leptin is now signaling back to this hypothalamus and to two groups of neurons within the hypothalamus. Is anyone unclear or want to explain in a different way? Have you all heard of the arcuate nucleus? Is it like your favorite nucleus? Second favorite after like the ventral hypothalamic nucleus, maybe? No? No. Okay, so 
leptin here through the ventral hypothalamus will actually signal through the sympathetic nervous system. It causes the release of noradrenaline, and this noradrenaline will work to actually produce heat. Okay, so that's like one way that leptin works. And it works to the sympathetic nervous system. And that's sort of through this ventral hypothalamic pathway and will actually cause um, the generation of heat. And again, we don't need to worry about all of the different details of how that might work. Here's that uncoupling protein found in the mitochondria, and that's why it generates heat. Um, and we know that it's incredibly important in uh, regulating beta oxidation. Um, but we're not going to concentrate on this. We want to understand the feeding behavior. So more importantly, in the arcuate nucleus, we have a number of different neurons that um, are actually going to be important. So in, within the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus, this group of neurons responding to leptin, uh, this group of neurons, when leptin is around, will cause the release of things like um, alpha MSH, melano, uh, melanocyte stimulating hormone, or MSH. Uh, it will also cause um, the inhibition in the arcuate nucleus of NPY. Now, I, it's been a whole week, so let's see how good your long-term memory is. Do you remember what NPY is? So first, just identify NPY. What is it? Neuropeptide Y. And why is that important? Why are we stopping neuropeptide Y? What does it normally signal? Is it for feeding, or does it stop you from feeding? So it want, if you have high levels of it and you're continually releasing it, you're going to um, cause feeding behavior. And now we're inhibiting feeding behavior. So leptin is released after a meal, and this is why it's important, right? So this leptin is then binding, uh, causing the release of, um, of uh, MSH, but it's also inhibiting the release of NPY from this um, arcuate nucleus. And this is normally involved in food intake, as you see down here, and now we're stopping it. So we've ate, eaten, our adipocytes are getting bigger, they're releasing leptin in response to it. Let's assume for the time being we have normal leptin, which is able to signal. And one other thing, because this is something I've asked in the past, I've always made the assumption that it was clear, but let's think a little bit about this. On this diagram, if I were to ask you, if I was looking at a DBDB mouse, remember DBDB mice? They're a little bit different. Where would I find the leptin receptor? So remember, they, they continue eat, to continue to eat. There's a problem, the DBDB mouse. Yes? OK, so that, that's, a, that's a safe answer. So there's, there's two groups of neurons. Is it arcuate or ventral? Arcuate, right? So the arcuate is where we have NPY. So without it acting on the um, receptors, we can't actually inhibit NPY release. So I'm going to ask you that question on your uh, first term test. So just make sure that you know NPY uh, uh, releasing neurons actually have the uh, leptin receptor on them because this is why it's being inhibited. It stops its release. We stop the food intake. The other thing that we see um, happening as well is this release of M um, alpha MSH. This works through the um, MC4 receptor. It's a type of melanocortin receptor that we'll talk about a little bit later when we talk about skin. Um, and then these activate the melanocortin receptors. And this will also um, inhibit food intake as well. So either of these pathways or both of these pathways are important. Now, in, in your tutorial this week, you're going to have some problems to go through to make sure that you get this idea reinforced. In the, in the tutorial, um, I'm hoping that this pathway, you need to think a little bit about it, but you can use your notes, um, and hopefully you'll understand like, the types of uh, problem-solving questions that I'm going to ask you on the term test uh, in tutorial, and they'll be very similar to what you get um, in your term test as well. So again, a big sort of uh, plug for going to tutorial. There was a, yes, yeah. So, so DBDB mice, um, ha nothing else is wrong. It's just the leptin receptor itself can't actually um, bind to and signal appropriately that leptin is binding to it. It's like not ever seeing leptin. So it's like not ha after a meal, 
So like leptin is not actually able to interact with the arcuate nucleus. Leptin is there, it's just not, the receptor is non-responsive. <laughs> so it's, it's been known to have spontaneous mutations, which makes it um, unable to cause the downstream cascade to cause this uh, sort of feedback. <laughs> Sorry, what if you? So, so you would have to deliver them exogenously, so a, a good copy of the receptor, and then you would be able to get restore the normal sort of uh, downstream pathway. Yes. Uh, is the receptor for leptin different on different populations of neurons? So is the leptin receptor in the ventral hypothalamus different than in the arcuate? No, they're the same. Yep, so all of these pathways would be affected. So, um, for example, they don't really generate a lot of heat because they just don't see leptin. That's correct. And, and that's one of the other reasons why you see their size is much bigger than uh, their normal counterpart, which I showed you in the last lecture as well. So it's a good, good question. Yes? So it's like both of the pathways, yeah. both the ventral and the arcuate. Yeah. Why did you say that um, the main pathway is connected with the CD like from the arcuate? Um, so the, the major effect on feeding is through the arcuate nucleus. Okay. Any other questions? Things that are, you just need confirmed? No. Okay. So again, we actually see this in um, humans as well. So there can be mutations in leptin. So it accounts for a very small number uh, of childhood obesity. Uh, there's some in some indication that maybe there's leptin resistance. So just like having too much insulin around could lead to insulin resistance, there's some idea that maybe um, the type of metabolic syndrome that we see just have too much leptin around, and as a result, you could end up with leptin resistance. Um, and that could be another way to shut off um, the receptor response. So just a couple of um, other quick uh, molecules as well. So one of the other molecules that I mentioned that was being released from these adipocytes uh, is um, uh, adiponectin. And when this molecule was discovered, and, and again, we kind of trivialize it, uh, and I talked about it in the last lecture, um, but leptin, when it was first identified in the early 1950s from Jackson Labs, it was actually a really, really big deal. It was one of the first molecules that was actually tracked from the periphery that went back to the central nervous system, and people spent um, decades trying to understand this pathway. But once that molecule was identified, like what is causing this metabolic condition in these mice, um, this, led to the, this, this led to sort of the idea that maybe these adipocytes are not just con um, containing triglycerides, et cetera, that maybe they are also releasing other factors in addition to leptin. And so people tried using positional cloning. They tried using um, other for forms of cloning. And one of the first molecules that followed was known as adiponectin. And adiponectin is actually found in very, very high quantities within your plasma. Your adipocytes release a lot of it. It's a, a fairly abundant molecule. Uh, it's found in the plasma protein. Forget the size, like I don't care if you know that it's 30 kilodaltons or not, but it is very abundant. So that part I, I want you to know. It's not a, a small molecule. It's not, sorry, it's not a um, minimally released molecule. There's a lot of it in your bloodstream at any given point in time. And one of the thoughts that um, uh, people had in the early 2000s is this adiponectin helps to sensitize different types of tissues, whether it's adipocytes, whether it's um, muscle tissue, et cetera, uh, that require insulin. And in some reports, it is used in place of insulin. So it's an insulin mimetic. It helps somehow to trigger the uh, infusion of glucose into the cell if adiponectin is around. Insulin doesn't have to be there, and it causes some kind of cascade which hasn't been fully identified that causes glucose transporters to translocate and allows for glucose to come in. And so it looks a little bit like insulin in its um, actions. Interestingly, adiponectin also has these anti-inflammatory properties. So it actually causes a reduction in inflammation. It's also thought to be anti-atherosclerotic. Um, so in other words, the hardening of your blood vessels 
um, will actually be reversed if you have higher levels of adiponectin. So again, it's been uh, really interesting to follow the trajectory of adiponectin um, as well. Interestingly though, and this is important, and this is why it's highlighted for you, adiponectin is released from adipocytes, and we talked about that in that earlier diagram, but it has an inverse relationship. The more of these adipocytes that you have, and in particular, the adipocytes that are found within the intra-abdominal region, the more of these adipocytes that you have, the less of this adiponectin that gets released. So your adipocytes get bigger, especially intra-abdominally, but they start producing less and less of this adiponectin. Now you can see why that would be bad. So if adiponectin is helping to sensitize tissues to uh, insulin, or even acting as an insulin mimetic, that's already bad because it might lead to insulin resistance. If it already has anti-inflammatory properties and you're reducing it, so normally it's at high levels in your body, you start to accumulate these bad adipocytes, you reduce the level of adiponectin, uh, you're going to have less and less anti-inflammatory adiponectin around, and you're also not going to be blocking or reversing um, atherosclerosis. So this inverse relationship is actually fairly unique. So make sure that this is a slide that's on your radar. It's an important one. Um, if you haven't heard of adiponectin before, uh, make sure that you spend a little bit of time on this one. It's probably a good multiple choice test question, and it's also um, probably a good question to know for the one-line responses as well. All right. So um, again, this is sort of an aside. Um, there seems to be like a, a lot of differences in fat deposition overall. So one of the things that um, is um, kind of a, an area of research that people are kind of doing, um, the, the places that um, men tend to accumulate more fat more readily and more easily is, is intra-abdominally versus females, which um, have a very different distribution. Their distribution is um, sort of below the waistline. So the apple versus the pear um, shape that we looked at before. Uh, and so we know that the male gonadal androgens have been associated with um, the adipocytes being more likely to accumulate uh, intra-abdominally and then form those bad adipocytes. Uh, reductions in uh, female hormones like estrogen, progestins, um, and uh, female gonadal an androgens also causes that redistribution. We're not really sure, if you go back, and you don't have to memorize this, we're not really sure like what that relationship is, but we know that um, they do release a number of steroids. Steroid receptors have not been identified so far in uh, these adipocytes, so we don't really know what the exact mechanism is, but it's a, a very interesting one. And it suggests that there's a role for hormones um, in this redistribution and how uh, these adipocytes might work in different individuals. So again, this is sort of a slightly different slide, but I wanted to also just reinforce this uh, really interesting protective role um, for um, adiponectin. So again, inverse relationship, and we're talking about adipose tissue, especially intra-abdominally, when you start to um, accumulate intra-abdominal um, adipose tissue, you cause a reduction in overall adiponectin levels. Normally it's fairly high, and it starts to decrease as we accumulate more and more, especially intra-abdominally. And we know it's actually um, not only anti-atherosclerotic, it's not only anti-inflammatory, but it has a number of other heart protective uh, properties um, as well. It might actually prevent the heart from becoming um, ischemic. So if you think back to what we talked about at the very beginning, we talked about cardiometabolic syndrome as part of like insulin resistance, and we kind of looked at this lipid dysregulation. And adiponectin might be one of those factors that helps to control the link between um, cardiometabolic uh, disorders, um, lipid dysregulation, um, et cetera. Um, and it's thought that it works through that anti-inflammatory response that I showed you a little bit earlier on. So especially through these different pathways, um, it, adiponectin might stimulate the cardiomyocytes within the heart uh, to increase the levels of AMP kinase or AMPK. This increases the supply of energy that's available as long as adiponectin is around and it prevents um, cell uh, death from occurring. 
Um, in addition to that, through the cyclooxygenase pathway, um, adiponectin will work to increase the levels of prostaglandin E2. So cyclooxygenase will cleave some of the fatty acids on the lipid membrane. And then this prostaglandin E2 will prevent the uh, release of tumor necrosis factor alpha, which is a cytokine. And this will, uh, again, um, block this um, cell death. And this ischemic heart, particularly in an ischemic heart where we have energy depletion, we need more and more AMPK. And if we don't have AMPK activated through like adiponectin, this energy depletion will enhance the cell death. So all things that, again, point to the fact that the adiponectin is sort of a very important molecule released from these adipocytes, and we get less and less of it as we fall into metabolic syndrome um, more and more. OK, um, the last one that we'll talk about, and then we'll take a quick break, is this um, other cytokine, which is known as resistin. One of the other molecules that I mentioned to you um, earlier on in that diagram of the adipocyte. Um, and then again, this is another factor, sort of like a hormone, sort of like um, a cytokine, so it's an adipokine that is released from these um, adipocytes. The receptors for resistin are found all over the place. They're found within the brain, the liver, as well as within the muscle. Uh, and we have very low levels of resistin during a fast, and we have higher levels of resistin after a um, meal, and depending on the type of meal. So this is one of the questions that came up in the last lecture. So if we're having a fast, so why do we sometimes like increase the levels of fatty acids, uh, uh, fats in our diet um, after a fast, uh, et cetera? So the content actually does play a role in the types of molecules that get released from these adipocytes. Um, and again, interestingly, if we took a look, the mRNA for resistin, uh, the highest levels that we actually find are within the visceral fat. Again, so intra-abdominally, visceral adipocytes have the highest levels of um, resistin. Um, we don't know, by the way, and this is like in 2020, it's still not 100% clear. The labs are kind of split. The research is split. Um, about 50-50. When we um, talk about the role of resistin, we're not 100% sure if the animal models actually represent the human um, condition. Resistin is one of those molecules that some people find um, really easily, and some people just can't detect it as easily. So it's a little bit of um, a crapshoot. Um, however, in animal models, where we started to infuse uh, resistin in um, to the uh, into the animal, one of the things that results is the more resistant that you're putting in, you're infusing this molecule, um, it actually enhances insulin resistance and it results in hyperglycemia. Now again, it makes a connection between lipid dysregulation, adipocytes, and these adipocytes that are particularly in the visceral region, if they're releasing resistin, although in humans we're not sure, in animal models, it's very clear that it will cause insulin resistance and will also cause hyperglycemia. Um, if you block resistance, you can neutralize it using either antibodies or completely dialyze it, removing it from the bloodstream. You can actually normalize um, insulin resistance as well as hyperglycemia. So suggesting that these adipocytes, again, producing all these different factors or stopping the production of these different factors might play a role in the development of um, what we see in insulin resistance or metabolic syndrome that might lead to cardiometabolic disorders, et cetera. Yes, way at the back. Oh, thanks. OK, can you still hear me? Not really? Kind of? OK, my mic died. Hmm. All right, let's, um, let's see if I can get the podium mic to work. Can, can, can you hear me now? OK, awesome. Um, all right, let's take a break. <laughs> OK, and, and when we take a break, uh, we'll come back. The next few slides are important ones, so uh, I'll try to see if I can fix the mic. Otherwise, I'll just use this podium mic. All right, we'll come back in about 10 minutes.
Could it? Was it ever streaming? Is there, is there something going on with the stream? I don't yeah, think, I don't it's, think streaming. it's streaming. <gasps> is it recording locally? I don't know. No clue. Because I just checked it before the break and it said it ended 19 minutes ago. So. Not sure. So if it's been backed up on the hard drive, it's recording. It's it says it is it's still recording streaming. on uh, on YouTube. OBS. A while ago, it wasn't streaming. Yeah, yeah. but like it says so still good. stop. Like the yeah, streaming is still on. It's recording though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's but, uh, and the, how do we get how do we get this how do we get this mic? Oh, it's working. See. Okay. I think yes, it's the computer. So like currently our voices are being recorded. But it doesn't mean Hi everyone's sitting. <laughs> well if it's not going to YouTube, <laughs> no then this is <laughs> No no not now, but like he posted online. Oh, so everyone can hear this? <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. I'm so wise around this. Yeah, I know, I'm confused. Because it says Well there's no thing you can go here. Oh, maybe that's why. Just connect to YouTube. It, sh it shouldn't work. Yeah. It's a just in case, but I'm gonna plug it. I mean, just leave it. Can you check it's streaming now? Do we have to restart it?
Wait, how do I get back to the presentation mode? I can't control the. How do I get back to the previous PowerPoint slide? Oh, yay. OK, yay. Thank you. <laughs> yay. Yay. All right. Um, so if you guys are OK, we're going to uh, just continue on with the next few slides. If you can't hear me, um, please let me know. There's no way to actually replace the batteries on this uh, microphone. So if you want me to, I can just stand here and use um, the wired mic. Um, so there's a couple of really important things that I wanted you to take away from this, and it's, again, a reinforcement of what we've been talking about so far. When we look at adipose tissue, which is uh, abbreviated here on this diagram as AT, so adipose tissue. So again, we have adipose tissue in a lean individual because we know adipose tissue is important. We need it. And normally, as I told you before, we consider adipose tissue to be a type of Connective tissue. Do you remember that from the last lecture? Connective tissue? No. Yes? Please say yes. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. So uh, we have blood vessels. We have adipocytes. We have macrophages. We have some lymphocytes. Um, and we also have some pre-adipocytes ready to go as well. So again, all these things um, are there. And then what we know happens is if you are engaged in less physical activity, um, or it could just be through um, different types of medication that you're on, and I'll talk about that um, a little bit later on, or just overnutrition, having too many calories around without the exercise, it can actually lead to this response that you are looking at here. And then what we see is that these adipocytes get bigger. They store more of that, um, the triglycerides that get produced, they get stored here in these larger um, adipocytes. And what we're seeing is a hypertrophy, a, um, an increase in size that um, we are looking at overall. We are not seeing a division yet that will happen uh, if this continues on. Surprisingly, even though there isn't anything to su suggest that there's an infection, when we start developing these types of adipocytes, we have this chronic, persistent, low-grade inflammation. So you, if you were to examine someone's blood, it would kind of look like they are fighting off an infection because they have this inflammatory response. Part of this is because the adipocytes that you are seeing here are producing and changing the types of molecules that are being released. And that was sort of the first part of today's lecture. So we saw a shift and a reduction in some cases of molecules. And that's part of the adipocyte um, milieu directly. Uh, and then we also have this other cell type that we haven't really concentrated on, which are these um, macrophages. And these macrophages, in turn, can also release a number of factors. And these two can be pro-inflammatory. So remember, I operationally defined adip adipose tissue, or that connective tissue, the adipose tissue, as containing not just adipocytes, but also these um, supplementary tissues. And all of these different factors can contribute to this chronic, low-grade, persistent inflammation. Now, this slide is a little bit busy, so I'm not going to concentrate on what's down here. And I'm going to ask you to just use this as a reference slide for our discussion in the next slide. Is that clear for everyone? All right. So you don't have to worry about any of these factors down here, although you'll see some familiar players like TNF-alpha. You'll see um, leptin. Uh, you'll see adiponectin, and all of these players are important, but we'll get to that in a moment. This is the more important slide, the one that I want you to be focusing on. So here, we're going to start with the left, and we're going to move our way toward the right. And what we're going to see is a nice, healthy adipose tissue, or adipocytes. And this, again, is connective tissue, the whole milieu. So we have the um, T cells, we have the macrophages, we have the adipocytes, and then in our definition that we started off with in last lecture, we also had these blood vessels. And it's important, just like when we will talk about cancer later on, when we see an increase in tissue mass, we also have to see um, an increase in blood supply to that tissue. It does not normally happen if uh, we get an expansion of adipose tissue, and I'll talk about that all the way over here on the right. 
So here is like a nice healthy individual, lean, normal metabolic function, adipose tissue. We need adipose tissue, you cannot get by uh, without it. So we have very low levels of um, inflammation uh, or no inflammation at all. And we know we have normal metabolic control um, of this tissue and we have like normal vascularization. I'm gonna point you to the fact that when we operationally identify this type of good adipose tissue, we find within this adipose tissue these M2 class classifications of macrophages, okay? And they're going to be important in our discussions a little bit later on. We will also have a very particular type of T cell, which is known as a CD4 positive um, T cell as well. Under normal conditions, healthy adipose tissue is going to be responsible for the release of anti-inflammatory adipokines that I've already mentioned, one being adiponectin. So hopefully you remember at least adiponectin, right? Because we spent time on it, we talked about it being good, and we talked about how as we convert and as we start losing good adipose tissue and it becomes like this adipose tissue, we release less and less of it. And adiponectin is always a good molecule to have. In addition to that, there's an, another anti-inflammatory adipokine that gets released known as F SFRP5. We'll come back to SFRP5 in the next uh, lecture as well. Now, as someone who starts maybe exercising a little bit less or starts to have like overnutrition or is taking medication and sometimes that happens, and I'll talk about my own particular case um, if we get uh, around to that today, we will start to see a shift. There's a slow shift and it will start to affect BMI. It will start to affect some of the biochemical characteristics. And here, we might start to see a transition. So this type of adipose tissue, where we still have some anti-inflammatory adipokines being released, but we're starting to see it declining, we're going to also start to see a shift in these M1, uh, the M2 to now this M1 macrophage. And this M1 macrophage transition results in more of the pro-inflammatory adipokines being released. In addition to that, the adipocytes themselves are also changing. So we're going to be changing like the release of leptin. We're gonna be changing the release of resistin. Um, we are again going to be changing the release of um, TNF alpha from some of the macrophages, et cetera. So the most important ones that I want you to concentrate on is that the release of these pro-inflammatory adipokines include things like leptin, resistin, um, and this uh, TNF-alpha, uh, and I'll throw in this interleukin-6 molecule as well. So this is one of the characteristic changes. The molecules are different now as it transitions more and more toward the right. And we also see a shift. We no longer see CD4 positive T cells. We get a shift over to the CD8 positive T cells. There are different type of immune cells that are being attracted, and the macrophages have also changed their phenotype. So we get a transition into the M1 uh, macrophage, and we don't see very many of the uh, M2 uh, over time. So more and more of the M1. If this continues on, and this uh, does not become regulated, we're not going to have any release of these anti-inflammatory cytokines. And if it continues on to where it becomes pathological, we will have full metabolic dysfunction. This is someone who has full uh, metabolic syndrome. It's untreated, unregulated metabolic syndrome. And here is that one instance that I told you about. Normally we don't lose adipocytes. They get bigger and then they divide. If there's no blood supply to them though, they can die through a necrotic process. And in fact, dying tissue in adipose tissue is very characteristic because we have these surrounding um, uh, macrophages and the dying, degenerating, necrotic adipocyte, they form this very characteristic um, structure which is known as a crown-like structure. So if you see a crown-like structure in adipose tissue, it means it is completely metabolically dysfunctional and it is only producing all of these pro-inflammatory cytokines that you see here. And from this list, you're only responsible for leptin, resistin, uh, and TNF-alpha and interleukin-6 as molecules that you would identify from this fully um, metabolically dysfunctional adipose tissue. Do you have any questions or things that you want to confirm 
or just to clarify before we move on. So this is an important slide. It's one you should spend time on. You should know the different cell types that are found in these different tissues. We see a transitional tissue that we see here in the middle. We see less and less of the adiponectin being released and more and more of these other factors. So please make sure that if you know you need some time to remember things and it's been a while since you've learned it, spend time going back over this. I can guarantee you that you'll see this on your term test um, on February the 4th. Any questions or things you want to clarify? Yes. So, so it's more likely that you'll see it at a histological level, that's correct. So not, not at a tissue level. <coughs> Any other questions? Yes, hello. Uh, yeah, so, so that's a really great question. There's, um, there's not a full consensus on it. So can an M1 um, convert to an M2 and can it go back either way or is it a completely different cell type or does it come from a common progenitor and it forms these different things? It, it's not clear. So some people say that it's a transition, it goes back and forth. Some people say no. Um, I'm, I'm, of the, uh, I'm of the opinion that it actually transitions back and forth. Um, and you're also going to see that we have an increased number of these different um, macrophages in general. So again, you could also argue, so if you were to look at all of these um, green cells, you still have them, uh, and then you have more of these blue cells, and then you have uh, these other, uh, sorry, so more of these sort of uh, reddish cells, you could make the argument that there might be a progenitor that's converting. So it's, it's unknown. Good question, though. Yes, yeah, Omar. Yeah, so, so it's just that the size of the tissue, um, just the blood supply isn't keeping up with it. So it's just like any type of cancer, like there's some uh, necrotic cores in cancer because the tumor just grows too big. So we're seeing something similar here. Yep, that, that's correct. And, and luckily here in this case, for most cases where we're accumulating adipose tissue, we don't also have the release of vascular endothelial growth factor, which would cause the division of blood vessels and, and cause them to continue. We don't see that here. Okay, so, um, so again, visceral fat seems to have some very specific properties, including the release of a number of pro-inflammatory cytokines, which we don't see in subcutaneous fat. So not only do we have this transition in the, um, in the uh, visceral fat, uh, we also see a change in uh, expression and release of TNF-alpha, interleukin-1, and 6. Um, and all of these different types of um, cytokines have been also shown to cause insulin resistance. So whether it's causing it or the cause of uh, insulin resistance isn't really known, but there is a strong correlation between visceral fat and the release of these factors and insulin resistance. All right, so um, here's where we can actually use this to um, our advantage. So if you look very carefully at one of the earlier slides, one of the things that I showed you kind of in passing uh, in, I think, this slide here, there is this pre-adipocyte. And it turns out that um, adipose tissue uh, actually contains stem cells. So as, as we continually um, form more of this adipose tissue, as we accumulate it, it turns out that um, we also have these adipose uh, stem cells um, as well. And this was first reported way the, all the way back in 2001, 2002. It hadn't been described before then, but there are stem cells within adipose tissue. And we call them pre-adipocytes, or we can call them adipose stem cells, whatever um, you want. They're a little bit different than the types of um, stem cells that we would find within the bone marrow, and they um, have some different properties. If you are an aficionado of stem cells, anyone an aficionado of stem cells? Is there um, anyone that knows what this refers to, CHA160? Any ideas? Guesses? Wild guesses, without looking it up. Yes. Uh, 
Uh, does it highlight cell division? It, it kind of does indirectly. Indirectly, it does um, highlight um, cell division. Any other guesses? Yes, Abdul Rahim. Right, it's a marker for stem stemness. So whether or not we have stem cells, one of the cell surface markers that we can use is TRA160. And when we think we have a stem cell within adipose tissue, we can use TRA160 to go back and mark whether or not it is indeed a stem cell that we are seeing within this adipose tissue. And by 2008, 2009, this has been well characterized. That in fact, TRA160 positive cells do exist within adipocytes, and it doesn't matter where you look, subcutaneous or visceral, they all have these pre-adipocytes stem cells that mark for TRA160. All on the same page so far. And we're seeing this sort of in uh, this green stain, and you can actually see the division of these cells, which is what you're looking at here. And these green cells are the stem cells which are maintaining their stemness that we can mark with the TRA160. So they continually divide and maintain themselves as stem cells. These are in adipocytes. Okay, are we clear so far? So TRA160 marker, for stem cells. And it doesn't matter what kind of stem cell, it just here it happens to be within adipose tissue. If we looked in bone marrow, we saw a bone marrow stem cell, we would still be able to stain that stem cell for TRA160 as well. If we found a uh, stem cell within the brain that we thought was a stem cell, we would mark it for TRA160 as well. Okay, so just a general marker. So there's some unique features of these pre-adipocytes or these um, adipose uh, tissue uh, stem cells. We can actually make them go into different cell lineages. Even though they're found in adipose tissue, because they are stem cells, we can drive them into a myogenic or muscle-like line, um, or even into the cardiomyogenic line. So a fat cell, theoretically, a fat stem cell, could become a cardiomyocyte. It has a lot of really interesting um, possibilities. There are some amazing potentials that are realized with this as well. So it's fairly easy and fairly unobtrusive to obtain fat cells to be used in um, these different um, types of um, cell line um, experiments. So if I get these preadipocytes or I convert some of the adipocytes into these stem cells, I can then drive them to become cardiomyocytes. And unlike trying to drive them from bone marrow, which is a very, very painful procedure. So some of you have gone in and had your bone marrow um, uh, sort of typed uh, in case um, someone with leukemia needs that bone marrow. It's a very painful procedure. You can't collect a lot of it. But um, taking adipocytes is actually a less invasive, not as painful um, procedure. In addition, not only do we have stem cells, we can actually reprogram adipocytes fairly easily. So if you have a lot of adipocytes, not only do they have pre-adipocytes or stem cells, you can also reprogram the adipocytes into being stem cells much more easily than you could with fibroblasts. In fact, it's twice as fast and it's 20 times more efficient than trying to convert human fibroblasts that is, are typically done in a lab, which are called um, IMR90, that's a cell line name fibroblasts, into different cell types like the myogenic line or cardiomyogenic. Adipocytes themselves can be easily converted into stem cells. We also don't need to have um, a feeder layer. So normally when you're growing stem cells, um, you actually require a feeder layer to support them. Um, and we call this a mouse embryonic feeder layer. Apologies, this is one of the places where I told you you're gonna have to write this meth layer, which um, I wasn't sure if you were all familiar with. This is a layer that um, supports and feeds uh, the growing stem cells that are sitting on top um, of them. So this is what MEF stands for. We don't need them if we're using adipocytes. Yes? We, we, so for these cells, they can't go totipotent. They can't form like every single cell type. They can form like the myogenic lines, cardiomyogenic lines, but we, but they. Plur, pluripotent, yes, yeah. Any, any other questions? No? Okay, it's way at the back.
Yep, we, we can re reprogram adipocytes directly, and we also have a population of pre-adipocytes, either one, and here I'm talking about adipocytes directly, they can be reprogrammed back into stem, stemness. So they can now express like tra 160 markers. There was another hand up over here. No? No, okay. All right, so again, um, in terms of how this can be done, so liposuction is an option, so you never really lose that um, adipose tissue. It just gets smaller if like you are um, engaging in exercise. Those, st those adipocytes are still there, they never disappear unless they become necrotic, but again, that's sort of the extreme case. And one of the procedures that is done is known as um, liposuction, um, and it's a very, very uh, popular form of elective. Uh, and in some cases, because of health reasons, it's not by choice, and it's a, therefore not a non-elective surgery. You need it, so it becomes uh, a necessary form of surgery. And there's about a quarter of a million of these done in the United States uh, per year. So roughly about 25,000 done in, in Canada per year if we use the uh, one-tenth rule for, for Canada. Um, and it's very, very popular. It's been around since about 1921 as a form of surgery. Um, and the modern techniques that are uh, used now have really reduced um, the dangers associated with it. Um, and again, there's a, uh, a number of various uh, techniques that are used to remove this fat that could be then reprogrammed into a number of various um, types of, uh, of um, uh, tissues, including myogenic and cardiomyogenic um, tissues. So, so nowadays, people use ultrasound to visualize where they're going to be removing these um, different um, uh, adipose tissues. Uh, the tumescent form of adipose tissue, where you actually inject in a saline solution, disrupt the, the adipose tissue, uh, and then um, aspirate it out, and you get a local anesthetic only. This tumescent form is the most popular form of liposuction that is done now fairly um, non-invasive, so it is invasive, but it's not um, as invasive as like bone marrow um, removal is. So very small incisions, about one to three millimeters. It can be um, taken on an area of the skin where you, may, you won't have like scar developing, um, and these incisions are, are fairly small to begin with. Um, and starting in 2012, people started to think that if we can get these adipose tissues, and we can reprogram the adipocytes and make use of the pre-adipocyte stem cells that already exist, maybe we could actually use them to our advantage. So we can push the adipocytes by reprogramming into a cardiomyogenic line. Could we make use of all of this tissue that is normally being discarded? So that's normally like just medical waste. It's, it's um, disposed of, it's burned um, in the hospital um, biohazard. Uh, um, material, but could we make use of this? Um, again, so apologies on this, but in your slides it says panicus, which is a spelling error. It's known as the paniculus, so there's um, excess um, um, fat deposition on the lower part of your abdomen that anatomically is known as the paniculus, and this is where we can actually get more of these adipose um, tissue stem cells. Um, and it and was used initially back in 2012 to see if it could help um, treat these heart attack uh, patients. And I'm gonna go through some of the different indicators. After removing this adipose tissue, and I'll go through the procedure in the next few slides, were they able to convert them into a cardiomyogenic line, introduce them back into the heart to improve heart function in individuals that had um, heart damage, and that's really um, the purpose of these next few slides. And, and it's thought that this is the year where this is going to become like a more um, popular um, technique. So if we took bone marrow, none of these uh, numbers are important. If we took about 40 cubic centimeters um, or 40 cc's, that's a fairly big syringe uh, of bone marrow, you would have about 25,000 um, stem cells. Uh, you would have to expand these stem cells to become useful. So you would have to culture them on that meth layer, so that mouse embryonic feeder layer. You'd have to grow them for about four to six weeks. The patient who's waiting to get treated would have to wait four to six weeks because we have such a small number of these stem cells. If you were to remove from the paniculus about um, 100 um, cubic centimeters, 
It sounds like a lot, 100 cc's, um, which is about the size of a small Tim Hortons cup. Uh, and this is typical from what you get from a liposuction. Um, you would be able to yield about uh, 10 million plus adipose stem cells. And this, again, look at the size difference in terms of the numbers. You don't really have to expand these stem cells um, very much. Um, so again, 20 to 40 million of these cells can be isolated, prepared within two hours after um, liposuction uh, with um, as little as 200 grams of this lipoaspirate. So two individuals coming in, get the stem cells out, uh, and you'd be able to um, use them. You don't have to expand them. So again, it's just a comparison of the numbers, the amount of time that it takes to get those stem cells to divide to this level of 20 to 40 million. Um, and you don't need to do that if you're using these um, adipocyte stem cells that you can remove from this adipose tissue. Um, and this was done initially as a double-blind placebo-controlled study. Very small numbers, all ethics approved. 11 men were ori originally en enrolled, uh, three women. Again, just in terms of um, the, the reporting, this was all done uh, in European individuals. Um, and 10 were randomized to study, and four were actually used um, as controls uh, in this uh, study as well. All of them came to the hospital suffering from a very severe heart attack. They underwent this uh, cardiac catheterization uh, to assess blood flow, and they also were there to um, have some of the um, arteries uh, expanded uh, using this coronary angioplasty as well. So they were there to kind of restore blood flow as much as possible. So with that in mind, with these different individuals coming in, um, this group back in 2012 wanted to see at least in theory, we can get a large population of these stem cells, drive them toward the cardiomyogenic line, and we have a large number of them. Can we use them to restore function in individuals uh, in their hearts um, after a severe um, heart attack? And so this, uh, the first study back in 2012 is from this Apollo study, and this is sort of the derivation of um, where they get their acronym. So it's a randomized clinical trial of adipose-derived stem cells in patients with um, elevation of myocardial um, infarction. Um, and again, it was led by these individuals in Europe. Um, and again, if you go through the numbers, this gives you about 20 to 40 million of these different um, stem cells. They were processed really quickly for reprogramming into the cardiomyogenic line. Then they were infused, because speed is like one of those issues. If you take some of your fourth year um, health and disease or human bio courses, you'll learn about the necessity of getting speed of recovery after myocardial infarct. We can't sit around for four to six weeks. That, that timing is just really not good for the patient. Here is a way um, around all of this. And these adipose-derived stem cells and regenerative cells were this one way to do this. So these patients that were coming in after a heart attack, their hearts were severely um, compromised. They were coming in anyways to get um, catheterization. So a catheter was put into their damaged heart to expand some of the blood vessels, that's the angioplasty, and through that same catheter that they were using, they were directly infusing in some of these reprogrammed stem cells that were going to be cardiomyogenic, so like having um, heart stem cells. Does that make sense to everyone? No, does not make sense to everyone? Kind of makes sense to some of you, I'll go with kind of makes sense to some of you. Does it kind of make sense to some of you? Okay, thank you. Um, so one of the things that was found, so taking out these large populations, so that's the advantage. You know, if you're going in for liposuction, you can get these, this large uh, population of stem cells. They exist. You can get s massive amounts of them. We can reprogram them fairly quickly. I won't go through all the steps that are involved, but you can do the reprogramming and introduce genes that will then cause them to convert into the myogenic line or cardiomyogenic line. Their heart muscle is damaged after um, heart attack. We want to replace some of those damaged heart muscle cells. We have a catheter in place anyways that they're coming in to get treatment for. And when we infuse in some of these converted adipocytes um, using either MRI or SPECT, which is single photon emitted computerized tomography, 
to examine heart function, they were able to show in those individuals that received these reprogrammed adipocytes that became cardiac uh, line cells, they had better blood flow uh, restored. The scar tissue was reduced after six months from 31.6% to 15.4%, so roughly half of what it was. And if you did not receive reprogrammed um, um, adipose tissue that would be in the cardiomyogenic line, there was no difference in the size of the um, scar tissue. It stayed the same after six months. So it stayed at about 24% of, um, of uh, the, what it was, and it had no change after six months. And there was an increase in heart performance as well, and it increased the heart performance by about 6%. Might sound like a minimal increase, but for someone who has a compromised heart, that, that increase is important. Okay, so was it a success? Uh, yes, and is 2020 the year that we will see this being uh, more standardized? Who knows, but it is uh, something that um, is being done in multiple centers, including here in Toronto. Um, do you have any questions or things that I can clarify for you now before we go on? So a couple of questions. So I'll start at the back and work my way forward. Yeah, nope, yes, you, sorry. Right, so they're measuring um, the ejection um, fraction, so how much blood is being ejected from the heart. So that's a sort of um, standard measure. Is there anything else that I can clarify for you? No? Any other questions? There are a couple of hands. Yes? Um, were there any issues with differential um, in, th in this case, no. Okay. At least there, there potentially could be. Um, there's still a lot of debate as to whether or not reprogramming is a, is a good thing, especially for transplantation. Um, there's no follow-up study to this. So one of the, the big issues, if you um, are taking other courses, like either in regenerative medicine, like in physiology, or you're taking other courses, like in HMB or in other departments, it's not really clear what these um, stem cells are doing. So you, you kind of imagine that, oh, they're replacing the damaged uh, muscle cells, but uh, in fact, when you go back and you examine them, it's not clear that they're actually doing that. So how it, it improves function, I don't know yet. Any other, yes, Omar? Yeah, I was just wondering if they, um, where is the reprogrammed um, adipocytes extracted in, in, in the same person? They, they weren't done in the same person, no. So it could be reprogrammed adipocytes from another? Yep, and, th and that's exactly what happened in this study. Nope, did not cause any uh, type of rejection. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, were there any ethical plans for uh, Nope, so they did have ethical um, approval for the study, um, and they realized that you know this was um, a trial. They didn't know what the outcome was going to be. Um, those patients were coming in anyways for an angioplasty to um, expand the um, arteries in the heart, uh, the coronary arteries in the heart. So there were there are no ethical concerns. So, yeah. Any other questions? No. Okay. How are we doing for time? Okay. Well. All right. So um, I guess I wanted to kind of transition into something a little bit different. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about how all of this relates to mental health. I wanted to go through some of the biology of what we think we know about. The, um, uh, mental health. Uh, and there is actually a biology associated with uh, depression. Um, depression is one of those really interesting things um, that I think um, has an impact for all of us here at the university and in general, like nowadays, uh, in terms of what we're kind of grappling with in terms of wellness. Um, I usually ask this to most of my students in my other courses, but when we look at depression as a disorder, um, for some diseases, we actually don't know when they began. So we don't have like a clear record of when things like um, Parkinson's disease began because we, th we only have the first record back in the 1800s, uh, early 1900s. We don't know about um, whether or not it occurred earlier. For depression, there's a very, very clear sort of historical record um, dating all the way back to like um, the Bronze Age where we know 
as soon as there was writing, people were describing things that look like depression. So we, we know that it's been around as long as we've had um, the ability to write about it. And people have been trying to understand the biology of depression for a very long period of time. So psychologists like Sigmund Freud tried to understand it from a biological perspective. We would not look at it as biology today, more as pure psychology. But he thought that there was some kind of biological principle by which um, you have depression because someone is, uh, has died, and um, this period of mourning and melancholia uh, led to an uncontrolled anger because the person that has died, you can no longer sort of uh, go back and um, manage that anger because the person's not there anymore. And he looked at death as a trigger for depression, which was very common in his, his time. And this inability to deal with that anger led to a biological phenomenon that he called um, depression. Um, and this resulted in suicidal thoughts or feelings and this inability to take action through that anger because the person's no longer there. That was the best explanation that he could come up with, the best biology that he could come up with, that depression is somehow an aggression or anger that's turned inward because there's no one to actually um, deal with that anger. Does that sound very biological to you? Not really, right? So there's no biology that's um, involved, and we would sort of laugh at that now, but that at the time uh, was considered sort of the biological model of depression when he first um, came up with it. I also wanted to talk about this because when you, we look at the overall burden of disease, and many of you will have uh, looked at that in epidemiology courses, et cetera, uh, and again, there's nothing on this slide that you need to worry about. If we look at the burden of disease, you, you kind of think about these diseases like the one I just described, like heart disease. You think, oh, well, that must have like a huge impact, and it does. But by far, unipolar depression, where you have like you have this low mood for a very long period of time, um, actually is much more severe. It impacts your lives and the lives of individuals around you for a longer period of time, and it affects more people. So from a from a purely um, health standpoint, looking at the burden of, the, of a disease, this is by far much more um, costly to us as a society. And just think about, think about this. So I, before coming here today, I spoke to um, someone who teaches in the Faculty of Engineering, and they did a recent survey of their own students, and they asked, how many of you feel like you have, um, um, over the past year, how many of you would indicate that you had uh, stress-related mental uh, wellness issues. Uh, what percentage of the students do you think that took part in that survey actually answered that they did? Any guesses? A third, a quarter? Yeah. The majority. Nice. Nice safe answer. Good one. Nice. Uh, okay, so I need a number. 90%. Okay, that's a really high number. I hope that doesn't reflect like how you're feeling. So, so um, the instructor was actually really shocked, and this was done in the Faculty of Engineering. Uh, and I spoke to uh, Ron Vanderkratz, and he was like, he was shocked. But 52% of the individuals across all years indicated, yeah, I just did not feel like I was mentally well supported um, at, at any given point in time last year. 52%. I don't know if you ever feel that way, but this actually affects um, your age group. And and think about that. Half of you will experience something where you feel like uh, you have a mental health related issue. So it's your age group that's affected the most by uh, mental health. But one in, th one in three of you, so let's use that statistic, the safe statistic, um, using that safe route. Um, so one in three of you will be impacted directly by um, some sort of mental health related issue. Eventually, 100% of you will be affected because it's your friend, someone that you know in your family, um, or it could be um, one of your classmates uh, that you don't know well right now that will be affected by 100%. So that, that's a scary statistic. There's nothing, we don't have like a 100% guarantee that any of you will have like a heart attack, no guarantee. 100% guarantee though, at some point in your life, you'll be directly affected by mental health and most likely uh, by things like unipolar depression. So there's been a huge increase, as you know, about mental health related issues on campus affecting students over the last five years. And I think that's been well documented. And um, we don't really understand fully the biology, but I'm gonna try to make the link, and it's not a perfect link, and some of it's correlational, but there's a strong correlational um, element between metabolic syndrome and or inflammation and 
mental health and depression. And that's sort of where uh, we're leading with this. It's also important to all of us, so uh, I know some of your TAs actually mentioned this to you directly in your tutorials. If at any point in time you do not feel well, um, and I know some of you are worried about participation marks, et cetera, um, and in fact, I think Amanda's at the back and she's actually um, working at uh, St. Michael's Hospital, right? And, and she's um, doing research related to um, suicide, suicide prevention. And so we do take um, your mental health like incredibly seriously here. If at any point in time you feel like you, there's just something that you don't feel comfortable about, please let us know. We will try to make things work for you. Your mental health is like the most important thing for you. Can also share with um, all of you that I've also had like mental health related issues uh, over the last um, sort of seven to eight years. And um, it's one of those things that I kind of now uh, think a lot about in terms of um, thinking, of it, thinking of it more like um, multiple sclerosis. I'm never really gonna be 100% well, or like diabetes, never gonna be 100% well, but I have lots of good days as long as I'm getting uh, the help that I need. And I want you to feel free to talk to any of us. It'll always be confidential, but your mental health is like incredibly important. And one of the reasons why I'm particularly interested in this is that over the last few uh, years, um, going through like depression and sometimes really severe depression, I've had to take like antidepressant uh, medication. And one of the side effects for me in terms of antidepressant medication um, is that I've gained a lot of weight um, by taking antidepressant medication. And it's not something that I'm uh, really that comfortable with, mainly because I also have like other concerns about my health. It's also like something that I'm uh, more conscious about. Um, and I've noticed like over the last six months where I've been taking like antidepressant, anti-anxiety um, medication, that one of the side effects for me has been sort of um, uh, consistent weight gain, even though I've been trying to exercise as much as possible. So I wanted to kind of discuss that with you to make sure that you are all aware of like why we're talking about metabolic syndrome, why we're talking about inflammation, and why we're talking about this link with like mental health. And mental health is again really important for all of you. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through this one slide and talk about dysthymia. And I think the one thing that I wanted to also make really clear um, we're going to talk about depression, we're going to talk about mental health, but one of the things that I wanted to um, let you know about, so there's this really great bullet point, and we, we talk a lot about bullet points and we talk a lot about facts, and these are taken straight out of the um, Diagnostic Statistical Manual, uh, DSM-4, which I still uh, have a copy of, DSM-5 has the same um, sort of statistics. So um, by every definition, um, like you would think, okay, after two years, this will go away. That, that is not the case. And if you have like mental health or if you have mental health related issues, um, when you look at these statistics and you look at these numbers, I don't want you to think that, oh, and everything will be okay after like one year or after like eight months. Um, so this time you may disappear after two years or it may be with you for five years or it may never go away and you might, just might be able to manage it. But the way that we're gonna functionally characterize this is that this is sort of a milder form of depression if you wanna think of it. And this is where you just feel like you're in a low dark mood um, and, and sad at least uh, for about two years on most days. So you, you might have great days. So I often have like even without medication, I often have like great days where I just feel like everything is going to be uh, great for a long stretch of time and then um, I might just start feeling a little bit more tired, a little bit more down, uh, et cetera. And so people with this type of illness get mildly depressed in this low dark mood where they just don't feel like they're energetic. And my, and my colleague, many of you um, are going to um, shadow uh, uh, my colleague, Dr. McIntyre, and he uh, characterizes it in this beautiful way. So imagine that you have like the flu and instead of like getting over the flu, like you have the flu for like two years and you just feel like blah, you can work, you can do things, but you're in this low, dark, no energy type of mood for at least two years. That's like what the dysthymia is like. You can, you can show up to class, you can still do things, but you just don't feel like yourself. And that's sort of what um, dysthymia might be best uh, characterized with. 
so you can still function fairly well on a day-to-day -day basis. You might even be able to concentrate enough to get to class, um, but you're just not going to be the same person. You know when you have the flu that there's something wrong with you, and it's the same thing. You know that there's something wrong with you if you have like dysthymia or if you have uh, depression. And, and because it lasts for such a long time and because it, you just don't feel the same, it often affects like parental um, um, uh, child relationships, it affects peer-to-peer -peer relationships. Um, these things tend to be um, affected. Uh, again, it can strike at any age, typically 15 to um, uh, about 40 years of age is most common, but it can also affect children and adolescents. Um, and this could be characterized just by being angry or irritable. Um, it doesn't have to look the same for everyone. And that's another thing uh, that I wanted to be like really clear about. Some of you have this image of what depression should look like in your head. And it might be that case for some individuals. But for some people, it's just like, I just feel like really angry. And I just feel really irritable. And just feel like I can't get things done. And that might be how they're experiencing whatever men mental health related issues, whether it's dysthymia or other things. So I want us to get past that stereotype. I want us to learn about the biology. I want us to, be f uh, I want us to feel free to talk about it, whether it's with your TAs. Um, and I know some of you have already um, heard that from Tao and from um, Amanda and others, but we, we want you to feel supported. And that's one of the reasons why we want you to come to tutorial to make sure that you feel um, supported wherever you're at. So I think I'm just going to wrap things up here uh, for you. We'll continue on in the next lecture. Here's what's going to happen next uh, Wednesday. So next Wednesday, I'm going to go through the rest of these slides. I'm going to probably add on a few extra slides. You're going to be responsible for that first hour. And then for the second hour, we're going to um, have a review session to get you ready for the term test. And I think one of your um, colleagues is preparing like um, a Kahoot. Do you know Kahoot? So they're going to prepare a Kahoot thing for us so we can have a little bit of fun and also just reinforce that learning. Have a great week. Stay mentally uh, well. Um, make, uh, take good care of your health. Um, make sure you're going to tutorial. And I'll see you all back here uh, next Tuesday. All right. Did, did it stream? Do you know it did it stream?